Okay, so hi everyone. Um, welcome back to my virtual speaker series, Indigenous Storytelling in Art and Literature. During COVID-19, our museum is continuing to work with New Mexico schools and teachers to support student learning, serving as a key resource for both teachers and students. Um, in this work, we're often asked about books, films, and other resources that teachers can use in their classrooms. Um, this series is aimed at kind of sharing those, some of those perspectives from, directly from the Indigenous scholars and artists. Um, we're really excited to host several speakers and to hear about their own experiences in, and contributions to the field. So thank you everybody for joining us and for spreading the word about the resources that are shared with us here today. Um, my name is Lilia McEnany and I am a curatorial assistant at the museum. And today we'll be um, chatting with Melissa Henry, a brilliant Navajo filmmaker who uses her work to connect Navajo culture with the rest of the world. Um, but before we start talking with Melissa, I'd like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, even though we're in a virtual space. Um, in Ogopoge within the Taiwo world. As a non-native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Taiwo people. And I wish to acknowledge all of the native people past, present, and future who walk on these lands. So Melissa, filmmaker Melissa Henry um, spent her childhood herding sheep, caring for livestock, and playing in the forest. Today, she makes innovative Navajo language films that appeal to people of all ages and cultural backgrounds. Often featuring her pets and animals on her family's land on the Navajo reservation, Henry's films employ voice, voiceovers that animate the thoughts and meanderings of the animals throughout the reservation landscape. Her short animated film, This is a Hogan, was pr produced for Mayak as part of the renewal of our upcoming exhibition, Here Now and Always. Henry has received a National Geographic All Road Seed Grant and a Sundance Institute Fellowship and has won the People's Choice Awards in the PBS Online Film Festival. So Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm really excited to hear more about your work. Um, so I always like to start these conversations by um, chatting about how you became interested in what you do. Um, did you have a single aha moment that you can point to or did it evolve in a different way? Um, thank you for inviting me to, to have this chat with you. Um, yeah, hey everybody, I'm Melissa Henry and I'm really happy that you can be here and hopefully the information will help you with your um, for those teachers out there to help you with your lesson plans and getting information out there. And it's always grateful to have places like Mayak, you know, go out the extra, extra mile to put Native voices and Native art artists out there. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I don't know if I have an aha moment, but I know that um, when I was in mid-school, I was shown a film by Melier called A Trip to the Moon. And it's a French film about a trip to the moon, a silent film, and I absolutely loved it. It was my favorite film for many years. And I don't, I don't know if that was the aha moment, but it definitely got me into film. And I didn't start right away. I started later in college. I was taking some film classes and we had these um, assignments that we would go out and, and do different types of films, whether experimental or narrative. And I leaned more to the experimental. I really love experimental film. And I kept thinking in the back of my head of that film, A Trip to the Moon. And so the reason I liked it is because it has this very playful, fantasy in it and it's it's just exciting to see and i kept saying i would love to do that one day i would love to make a film that anybody could watch and that anybody could be excited about so i guess if that's my moment that would be my aha moment interesting so um you said it's the playful fantasy um aspect of a trip to the moon that really captivated you. And I think that's really, um, that influence is very clear in the films that you make today. But for viewers who may not have seen your work, can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, what are your films about fundamentally and how do you convey the stories that you're telling in this playful fantasy kind of way? Um, I'd like to like that my films are a little more experimental. Mm -hmm. um, there's no real clear narrative in my films. I do focus on animals a lot because I love animals and follow the lives of animals. One of my more successful films, Horse You See, is about a horse, for example, and he happens to 
speak Navajo and just kind of talk about himself and the things that he enjoys in life. Um, there's really no story to it, except that we're learning about this horse. Um, another film of mine, Run Red Walk, is, is similar. Like the dog is looking, the sheepdog is looking for um, his flock of sheep, but he, he encounters different creatures in the forest, you know, in the form of puppets. And it's just kind of like we're just following the dog. There's no real narrative. And I, and I like to keep it like that because I feel like life really isn't, you know, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Like there's all these in-between things that happen that don't make any sense. And so I think my films are like that. And I do like to make my films something in Navajo. Most of my films in Navajo, yeah. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, so why do you, you think it's important to include um, Navajo language in your work? Well, I, I like to include Navajo language in my work um, because I grew up around Navajo. I, I, I like the language and some of the films I make only make sense to be in Navajo. Like I think of course you see where in English, for example, it, it, it wouldn't make any sense. It doesn't have that feeling. When my dad did the voiceover for Horse You See, it really captures that cultural experience, I guess I could say. It really shows the essence of Ross the Horse. And I was once told that maybe I should do an English version, but I don't think it would really have the same impact. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the film, he sings in Navajo. And there are very simple lyrics, you know, about him being a horse. But if you sang it in English, it would just, it wouldn't, it doesn't have that um, essence. It doesn't have that magic, mm -hmm. I think, that it would have if it were Navajo. The same thing with Run Red, Red Walk, that's in Navajo as well. And I made that film because you know, I grew up herding sheep and I always, we would always have a sheepdog with us and the sheepdog would go and run off into the forest. And I'd always say, I wonder what those sheepdogs bark at and what they, what they do. And so that's where the film came off and um, came from. And I wanted to make that an Navajo because it, it just made sense. You know, when I, when I grew up, I was, you know, around Navajo language. I was in Navajo land. So it makes sense to be in Navajo. Um, and there's a bird in that, in that movie who kind of scolds Red Dog for losing sheep. And she does it all in Navajo. And that's just a typical Navajo grandma, you know, getting yelled at by your Navajo grandma. It's funny, it's hilarious. And it just, it just captures that Navajo-ness, if I could say that Navajo-ness of that moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, this is a hogan is in English. Um, and I did that because I, I just felt it worked like that. It worked like that. And because it needed to be to, to a bigger audience and my focus was more on the younger kids, mm -hmm. that it, it needed to be something that was kind of a mindful experience, not so much like at the beginning, you know, we, you know, the, we had to find homes and we did, you know, going to a whole story to where I think a kid would get lost in that. But keeping it rather simple and having the kids focus like this is a hold on. This is Red Ant's hold on. I think made a lot of sense to be in English and to be um, a little more engaging for um, a younger audience. Yeah, and I feel like um, the way this is a Hogan is organized, it's very transient. You know, it feels very calm and just like almost meditative in its own way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like it came across really well, especially given that your topic is home, to have that be the tone of it. Um, 
So as we mentioned earlier, um, this video, um, this film, This is a Whole Gone, is for my renewal of our permanent exhibit here now and always, and it's going to be included in the section on home and community as appropriate. Um, so how did you think through conveying a sense of Navajo home um, and community through your film? How did you think through how to do that? Can you repeat that again? Yeah. It, it kind of went in and out. Oh, sorry. Um, so how did you hope to convey a sense of Navajo home and community through making this film? Like, what was your plan? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, when me and my husband were coming up with the story to this or the script, um, Alfredo, my husband and producer, had explained to me that he, if there's one thing he noticed in you know, being around my particular Navajo community is that we're very adaptable, that we can adapt to all sorts of things. And he thought it was important to, to put that in the film. And so I thought the best way to do that is just to show not, you know, the, the romantic Navajo home that is kind of stuck in the 1950s and 60s, but to kind of show the evolution of the Navajo home. So the beginning, I start with, you know, that the people have no home, which is in the origin story. The people have no home, so they got influenced by the animals to kind of figure out how they're going to make their home. And so they start about, um, we start with ants home, and then we move to eagles home and beavers home. And with every step, with every um, animal, the, the humans get better ideas on how to improve their home to where we end up with, you know, the glitter Hogan and uh, the space Hogan towards the end of the film. Um, but I did want to show that no matter where we are, no matter what, where we are and, and when we are, that we always have a Hogan, that we can overcome a lot of different things and we can make our Hogan anywhere whether it be on the Navajo Nation, whether it be in New York City, whether it be on the moon. So I thought that would be a good example of how adaptive my Navajo community is. Yeah, and- um, In changes in the world, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it really um, works against a lot of the um, stereotypes of Navajo people um, being- mm -hmm past, you know, and not living in contemporary society when really Native people are just adaptive as everybody else. <laughs> um, yeah, and, yeah, humans are very adaptive. Right, exactly. And, and it is important to show that, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, why, um, I guess it speaks to a lot of larger issues, but why do you think it's important specifically to show um, Indigenous perspectives and narratives and adaptiveness in film? Um, I think it's important because there's not a lot of films that, um, like for example, when I was once teaching a class about Beyond Hollywood, it was called, and I wanted to have a section focus on Native films. And it was really hard to find Native films that were now you know that that are happening now and and i know filmmakers i know filmmakers who are making films now but i couldn't find the films that were in the list of films that we could order for the university and so when you see something like that you understand that yeah it is important that native americans make films not just for themselves and for their communities but for everybody because we live in a diverse world we live with other cultures and other people. And it's important that we have access to information to learn about each other. You know, although I'm Navajo, I, you know, I don't really represent every Navajo in the world, but at least they can have a perspective of a Navajo and have, a, have an idea. So I, yeah, I think it is important for Natives uh, um, to make their own films, to show their own films and to show from point of view. Yeah, and I think um, your films really 
do that in a really accessible and clear way that um, is rare and can kind of um, combat, combat stereotypes, kind of getting at things in a new way. Um, mm -hmm. Really brilliant. Um, so switching, thank you. Um, I'm wondering how your work as a teacher influences your approach to all of this work. Um, hmm. I guess, well, I, I, before I became an elementary art teacher, I taught at the university for a while. And I have to say, I really love elementary art. I, I think it's exactly where I need to be. Um, if it had any influence, it would be being able to have access to a lot of films from all different people, all different cultures. Has huge influence on how I make my films. Um, in terms of education, hmm. I think now, like this moment, I know who I'm making my films for now. I know that I'm really good at making films for kids who are from kindergarten to second grade. Like those are my audience members. I, I love that age group. I love the imagination. I love how much when I teach these groups of kids, they have so much influence on my own work because they don't have all of the outside information coming in to change their mind about, you know, fitting in with this group or that group. When you say, you know, we're going to fly in a banana shaped bus to the moon, they, they know that it's a serious thing. They know that that's possible. You know, they, they don't look at you and say, that's just silly. They go with it. And that's what I really have learned from that age group is to just always think it's possible and, and not to lose that. Because as you grow older, I feel like, you know, we become more serious and, you know, try to, make sure that we're doing things like this and like that. And, and we lose some of that playfulness. And I think that's why my films have to always be playful. I've tried serious films before and they just bombed. They, 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 I just had no excitement in it. Mm -hmm. it. It was just too much. And I like to play in film. It's my playground, and I always joke with my husband that, you know, I live in a cartoon land, and that's where I like to be. That's fabulous. I love that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, going back again to this is a hold on, I think museums are often seen as this very serious, sterile place, mm -hmm. right? And your film is really going to add a lot of dimension to the exhibition by... Um, foregrounding playfulness and just imagination and yeah it's just so important mm -hmm. so many different aspects of um where society is at right now um so are you working on anything exciting that you'd like to share um at the moment sure yeah um i am working on um i just recently got the john the senator john Pensno grant and that will help cover the expenses for uh, voiceover for my film called Meow Loses a Button. And it's another animation. Um, it's a cat who has moccasins, of course, and he is searching for his button. And I, I wanted to focus again for the young kids, K through two, who are learning about letting go of things, of being able to, to say, okay, I, I don't need this anymore. It, it's just, it's materialistic and I will be okay without it. Um, so that's what that piece is about. And hopefully um, my goal is to have it done before fingers crossed. Um, I'm hoping I can get it done by December of 20. 20, but you know, it's all fingers crossed. It's always fingers crossed. There's always something that comes up. 
um, that it's all drawn, I just need to do the voiceover. And that one's going to be a combination of Navajo and English. So I think it works really well for that particular film. And other thing I'm working on is my collages. I am doing a series of collage cats. And um, if you want to see more of the collage cats, you can go to my website at melissahenry.com and go to the shop and you will see all of the collage cats there. And if you haven't guessed, I love cats. I, I really love cats. I grew up with cats. Um, we always had plenty of cats hanging out. And I think those are the main things I'm working on right now. Very cool. And then and trying to be cool under quarantine. That, okay. that, you know, that, that is also a thing right. I'm working on. <laughs> Not to mention all your teaching. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so as you're kind of, as we're kind of in this moment, in 2020 right now, um, and we're looking towards the future and filmmaking and education and really storytelling more broadly, where do you see all of this moving? Um, are you optimistic towards more representation um, in filmmaking, for example, or where do you see your different fields going? Yeah, I mean, I see it, we have more access to technology and ways of sharing information with each other. Um, so it's definitely there. I think it's all going in a positive way. Um, it doesn't all necessarily need to be films that make it to Sundance or to big film festivals that will be noticed by people. I think even a kid on the reservation with their, you know, with their phone making a movie just for them and their friends is is just as important as somebody who gets into the Sundance Film Festival because we have access to all this information. We share information with social media. I mean, it is just out there. Now, um, I, it would be great to have maybe a few more like uh, networks that are dedicated to maybe native films or maybe more independent type networks or groups. Um, that Those are the only things that I can think about right now. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's going in a positive direction. More voices, more people, more young people coming in um, with their different points of view. Because, you know, the person that is way younger than me grew up very different. You know, um, my nephews who are, you know, Navajo too, you know, they're growing up in Santa Fe. They have a very different story to tell than I do. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important point about um, access and young people um, just making films on their phone in the reservation. I think that's hugely important. Um, mm -hmm. So um, kind of to wrap up, have you recently seen any films that you think my viewers might be interested in? Um, yeah, I mean, I love watching films, but I have, I've seen some trailers from a really good friend of mine, Gwendolyn Cates, and she, she, she is a native, but she does focus on a lot of native issues. And I think um, for older students, her films would be very appropriate. Um, other works like Ramona Emerson's films I absolutely love, you know, very positive films that she makes, especially the Mayors of Ship Rock. You know, that, that's a really great film about groups of kids coming together to help their community. So you have a story about a group of kids in a Ship Rock area who come together as a community to help elders and other people in their community. And I think that's a really positive film for young people to see. Mm -hmm. I would say mid school, high school would be a good crowd um, for that particular film. And the reason is that there's always, or at least for when I was growing up, there's always the you need to leave the reservation in order to do things. You need to leave to uh, make a life. But some of these kids aren't. And this is a great example of that. These kids are, are absolutely fine with being on the reservation and working in the reservation. And I think it's really important to show that. 
know, even some of my own relatives have decided that they want to stay home. They want to live on the reservation. They don't need to go out somewhere else. They can be just as happy and fulfilled living, you know, on their ancestral land. So I really like that film, The Mayors of Shipra. That's a really great point. Um, mm-hmm. I, just, I feel like I need to watch that. Right? <laughs> um, so <laughs> to finish, is there anything else that you'd like to um, chat with my audiences about? Um, hmm. I have to think. Well, I would like the Mayak audience, if they haven't seen This is a Hogan, to watch This is a Hogan. And especially educators, on This is a Hogan link, there's a link in the comment area with a lesson plan. So you can click on that link. There's a lesson plan um, that I put together myself. So I'm hoping that'll be helpful for those of you who are trying to look for things online. And I do have plans to put my other films up. Um, they are up, but to include lesson plans with them as well. Because now that I'm an educator, uh, especially for public schools, I, I understand like how sometimes you just, you need that extra help from another teacher, especially during remote learning. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Melissa, for taking the time to chat. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in.